Let us talk about visual system, which we have already mastered in Aftel. I'll try to go a little faster. The optic nerve cranial nerve 2 is a special somatic efferent. Look at the retina. Embryologically, where it comes from? It comes from the optic vesicle of the diencephalon. It contains the efferent fibers that give rise to the optic nerve. If you look at optic nerve, honestly we should not call it a nerve. Optic nerve is actually a fiber tract derived from the diencephalon. It is sensitive to 400 to 700 nanometers. So this we have umpteen number of times reviewed in ophthalmology. The visual fields from the retina, how do they pass, how do they decussate in optic chiasma. So how they will be ultimately landing up at later geniculate body and ultimately will be projecting to the visual cortex which is located in uh, the area 17. And in the process, what is the importance of the pulvinar nucleus in the thalamus which is the largest nucleus, etc, um, etc. Et now, you are a radiologist tomorrow. So what will you recognize doctor? You have this optic nerves and uh, uh, they are ultimately joining up at the optic chiasma. Now this is a coronal view where it is uh, a optic nerve entering optic canal has been projected over here. Then this another important view where uh, you are able to see that there are cerebral, anterior cerebral arteries. Beneath that you are having the optic chiasma and uh, the pituitary stalk. So these are all the important structures which are very closely related. Now, in the retina what is optic disc doctor which we have spoken in length. Uh, in ophthalmology. It is located 3.5 mm nasal to the fovea centralis and optic disc basically contains the unmyelinated axons from which layer of retina, ganglion layer of the retina and uh, the optic disc from where the optic nerve is starting, if you take that area, it's called blind spot because it doesn't have rods nor cones. And it contains one central cup, a peripheral disc margin and the retinal vessels which are passing through it. Then you have one macular lutea, which is a yellow pigmented area that surrounds the fovea centralis. Fovea centralis, which is in the center of macular lutea, is about 2.5 disc diameters from the optic disc. Optic disc is here, 2.5 disc diameters temporal will be the fovea centralis. Fovea need to be remembered because it has only cones. Optic disc need to be remembered because it has no rods, no cones. It is a vascular fovea and uh, it uh, is by the diffusion from the chorea capillaris it will be receiving all the nutrients and since it has cones it mainly helps in the photopic day vision and also in the color perception. Now what is the blood supply to the retina mainly doctor? Underneath the retina you have the choroid. So the choreocapillaries of the choroid will be supplying nutrients and the central artery of the retina which is the branch of the femoral artery is another important supply, blood supply to the retina. Now if you look at the cells of the retina, there are a chain of three different neurons that project the visual impulses via the optic nerve and ultimately to the lateral geniculate body to the visual cortex. Now what are the various types of cells? You have the photoreceptors which are called the rods and cones. They are the first order receptor cells that respond to the light stimulation and uh, they basically generate 
only graded potentials, not action potentials. And they utilize the glutamate, one of the favorite MCQ of the examiner. Glutamate is the neurotransmitter used by the rots and cones. Anyway, we will discuss this more in uh, physiology. Rots are around 100 million. And they contain rhodopsin, which is visual uh, pigment. And uh, they are sensitive to low intensity light and the scotopic night vision. Cones are only 7 million. And they contain iodopsin, high illumination. They are localized in fovea centralis. And they are important for the color vision, visual acuity and the day vision. So how will be the convergence, doctor? Typically, if you look at uh, the rods, the rods will be typically having, have a higher convergence, which ultimately to the, where will convergence occur? Rods or cones will ultimately converge onto bipolar cells and ultimately into retinal ganglion cells. Retinal ganglion cell fibers constitute the optic nerve. Now, what are these bipolar cells? Bipolar cells are called the second order neurons. Lot of times students will have confusion. Finally, if an MCQ comes, what is the second order neurons? We will be thinking, is it ganglion cells or bipolar cells? Without any second stumbling, you need to answer. Bipolar cells are the second order neurons that basically relay the stimuli coming from the rods and cones to the ganglion cells. Just like rods and cones can only produce graded potentials, even bipolar also. They also will utilize glutamate as the neurotransmitter. Then after the bipolar cells, everything will merge on to the ganglion cells, which are the third order neurons. And the axons of these ganglion cells, they basically form the optic nerve. Now, if you look at the ganglion cells, ganglion cells are those retinal cells which have a voltage-gated sodium channel. And uh, they produce action potential. So what will photoreceptors produce? Graded potential. Bipolar cells, graded potential. But it's the ganglion cells that produce the action potential and they have the voltage-gated sodium channels. Ultimately, the fibers of the ganglion cells will be projecting to superior colliculus, to the pretectal nucleus. Why pretectal nucleus? Because from the ganglion cells, the fibers go to pretectal nucleus, Edinger westphal ciliary ganglion, sphincter pupillae, pupillary constriction, whenever the light falls. Then why will they go to superior colliculus? To the superior colliculus, lateral geniculate body, and ultimately to the visual cortex. Then they also project to hypothalamus because hypothalamic nucleus is what? Which nucleus? Suprachiasmatic nucleus is there, no? It receives the input from the ganglion cell fibers. And that's how our uh, circadian rhythm is controlled by supraoptic nucleus when it receives the clue from the uh, ganglion cells about the daylight or night. Huh? Then ganglion cells also use glutamate as the neurotransmitter. So they are the main cells. Then typically in the retina we have interneurons. One type of interneurons are called horizontal cells. What do they do? They interconnect the photoreceptors, interconnect the photoreceptors one with the other and also the bipolar cells. They basically cause the inhibition of the neighboring photoreceptors. That is called phenomena of lateral inhibition. So that there is a sharpening of the visual focus. Credit goes to these interneurons which are called horizontal cells which are inhibitory interneurons. Even horizontal cells produce graded potentials, they use GABA as a neurotransmitter and they are very important to play a role in the differentiation of the colors. Credit goes to the lateral inhibition created by the horizontal cells. Then we have another type of interneuron which is called amacrine cells. You can see this is the amacrine cell, this one is the amacrine cell and uh, you have the bipolar cell. So we are talking about this amacrine cell. 
these are the amacrine cells they don't have any axons but they have few dendrites they receive an input from the adjacent bipolar cells and they in turn will project the inhibitory signals the amacrine cells uh, project the inhibitory signals to the ganglion cells and what is their importance since they are receiving input from bipolar cells and they project to the ganglion cells they create a bipolar ganglion cell synapse they are the mediators of the connectivity between bipolar and the ganglion cells these interneurons which are called amacrine cells they utilize gaba glycine dopamine acetylcholine as the neurotransmitters amacrine then we have muller cells what is the importance of it mullers are fundamentally like astrocytes in the brain what is the purpose of astrocytes they provide blood brain barrier and they are supporting cells so the radial glial cells are called as muller cells they have a support function you can see the inner part of a muller cell they have got a support function similar to astrocytes and typically they extend all the way from inner limiting membrane to the outer limiting membrane they extend the muller cells this is all the story of the cellular architecture of the retina now we talk about the visual pathway so what do you have in uh, uh, visual pathway that's good vijay rohit is very strong to know why absence is involved in partial vermis when medulloblastoma is compressing it our neurology unit 1 chief already said mannu proposes that medulloblastoma is very close to the pons lower pons so it lead to compression while growing on the abdicens which is exiting the lower pons see one chief talks to the other chief and they are getting the answers so the role of uh, attending uh, any interactive program is to get good friends so that uh, nowadays with facebook twitter social media and online websites it's easy to get a solution so shortly we are also coming up with uh, a facility for posting your specific questions where others can like a forum so a more interactive forum so our wordpress site is getting ready shortly all right so temporal hemi retina and we have a nasal hemi retina retina is uh, two parts but there is a small fixing part in this what is that if you look at the temporal part of the hemi retina it receives the impulses coming from the nasal part of the visual field agree doctor and nasal part of the hemi retina receives the visual impulses coming from the temporal part of the visual field that is the reason when the nasal hemi retinal fibers pass through the optic chasm and undergo decussation so if you have a pituitary adenoma compressing the optic chasm centrally who can got affected nasal hemi retinal fibers but nasal hemi retina is receiving the impulses coming from temporal field hence you have the blindness involving the temporal fields and you get a bitemporal hemianopia right and any compression coming from lateral aspect and uh, compressing is affecting the uncrossed fibers of the temporal hemi retina which is receiving the vision from the nasal field hence binasal hemianopia will be there by a laterally compressing uh, folks that's all the story so where will temporal hemi retina will be ultimately projecting into the lateral geniculate body of there here there is a interesting part if you look at the lateral geniculate body first of all where is geniculate bodies are located they are part of thalamus or midbrain thalamus thalamus or midbrain 
ah thank god i still remember at the end of the neurology posting in md our chief asked spinal cord is a part of lmn or umn that was the last day of posting our answer was lmn oh you learned a lot go home you can't learn also so then while coming we thought why chief said like that oh even cortico spinal descending tract is there so it can be lmn umn both the things so at the end of neuroanatomy if you are still thinking geniculate body is part of which uh, then uh, yeah i think i taught you very well all these uh, previous 20 classes 20 hours all right i'm happy everyone is saying uh, uh, correct answer only huh eh? good so if you look at this lateral geniculate body it is somatotopically divided so the temporal hemiretinal fibers which are coming from ipsilateral they will be going to the uncrossed way they will be going to the ipsilateral lgb lateral geniculate body they report to layers 2 3 in the somatotopic organization of the lgb whereas if you look at uh, the nasal hemiretina it goes to the contralateral lgb and it will be reporting to the layer 1 4 and 6 that's the whole idea that lateral geniculate body is somatotopically stratified 